start. I um, appreciate you all being here this evening. We know it's a really crazy time with report writing and marking and all the rest. So we, uh, it's lovely to see you. I'm Ange Fitzgerald. I'm part of the Faculty of Education and the Science Ed team in particular at Monash University. And I'd like to really welcome you to the second in our Engaging STEM Education series. And um, we kicked off at ScienceWorks last term and it's an absolute joy and pleasure and we thank Joanna for uh, allowing us to be here at Blackburn High tonight and hosting us, which is much appreciated. Um, but so tonight we're um, carrying on with uh, the approach we used last time, which is a panel. And we have um, a wide range of people here this evening who will talk to you about their um, ideas around approaches and pedagogies for effective quality STEM education. And um, I uh, will just not play much of a role really. I'll hand over to them to uh, introduce themselves as well as talk a little bit about what they do and then launch into their presentation. But um, what I do ask of you though is um, a couple of things. One is uh, we are streaming this evening. So hello to all of you um, watching along at home. It's great to have you with us as well. So uh, please just be aware of that, but also keep your questions, um, scribble them down and uh, you'll be, have a chance to ask them at the end of, of the panel presentation. So we'll kick off um, with Joanna Alexander, who is the principal here at Blackburn High School. Thanks. I want to thank my staff that are here because I know they're going through an intense period of um, exam marking and preparing for their reports and I know that there are other teachers here who are going through that. Um, I was asked this evening to um, provide the venue which we, which we are and very happy to have that um, and there were a few questions that I was asked to respond to. And one of those questions was, um, what entices me about STEM? Well, firstly, as a math science teacher, um, it makes sense. It's something that we've been doing for thousands of years as human beings, and that's the critical thing. It wasn't invented um, last year or 10 years ago, and the terminology 21st century learning is something that has been happening with the Chinese, the ancient Greeks, etc. So the enticement comes from um, this love of, of learning about the world around us. Secondly, as educators, um, we have a moral obligation to prepare our students for the future. And I know that um, in the area of maths and science in particular, um, by year eight, the majority of students, close to about 80%, are disengaged in science. Now that is to our detriment as a human race because we are shutting the door to young people that can make huge contributions. STEM provides that avenue now where we try to make it much more real for them. The other thing too about what entices me is that we have a directive from the department and I'll quote from the Department of Education and Training um, priority that emphasises the importance of STEM education as being vital for all of our young people's futures regardless of their intended pathway. And that's what I'm saying about the fact that a lot of them are switched off. Some of them take it all the way up to year 12 to get a really high enter score because you know the, 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 it's always sort of um, scaled up. That's the other area that we're sort of getting um, young people. The, the department goes further and says um, developing STEM knowledge and skills is, is seen as critical um, to facing current and future challenges within the state. So they see it as an economic imperative for, them, for themselves. And this includes um, living in an ever-changing environment, um, managing our food and water, um, ensuring basically that the health and the welfare um, services continually improve. So they're really the imperatives that, um, that drive me as a person, but also as a principal, to try to ensure that it becomes an option for young people to stay with the, the science and maths. Okay, that's the first thing. There was another question that I was asked, um, what does STEM mean to, to us at Blackburn High School? Well, it's in the embryonic stages at the moment and we've tried to implement it in a range of areas 
in our structure and programs. Um, firstly, um, our idea about STEM, and this is one of the things I've said at, at, a star, at several staff meetings, it's a way of thinking. You know, this ancient way of thinking about curiosity around the world and problem solving. It's based on finding solutions to real world problems um, using basically um, the integrated approach of big ideas or concepts. So that's the thing that we're talking about here. Um, now, usually these concepts are taught in discrete units like maths or English or science or humanities. But STEM provides us with a, a cohesive learning model that, that uses all of those and integrates them as we need them in order to make sense of whatever we're doing. So that's our belief. Um, the other question I was asked is about um, STEM and some of the ped pedagogies. Well, STEM emphasises project-based learning underpinned by inquiry and inquiry approach. Now, the skills that um, students develop within this approach and are categorised, and you would have heard the soft skills and the hard skills. The soft skills being what we call the interpersonal skills, the teamwork, problem solving, looking at um, critical and creative thinking, communication, all those sorts of things. And the hard skills are the things that we consider as the knowledge, those, those, the, the knowledge that underpins the concepts, the literacy, and you could look at um, digital literacy and design, and also the other discipline um, um, knowledge that we have. At Blackburn this year, we introduced a year nine subject called Connections. And what we decided to do as a school was to use this inquiry-based approach that, that aligns with the four capabilities within the Victorian curriculum. Those four capabilities are critical and creative thinking, ethical capability, intercultural and the social and emotional. So we have a subject that basically has those soft skills that we're looking for in developing within our students, an inquiry based approach, and the children will be undertaking project based work around a real life problem. And some of those problems that um, the students will be undertaking will be what is, I mean, they don't all have a choice, but if they don't, we've got a plethora of examples as you do with some of these. Um, things that you do with young people. Um, what is high quality water and is there equity around its access? Comparing the quality of health care between the city and rural areas, how can technology bridge that gap? Um, we also have a look, uh, another area is recycling materials. Will we ever need to mine for resources again? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the, so these are the types of real life problems that um, our students will be engaged in. Um, in addition, the school decided last year that we were going to invest in a 3D printer laboratory. And the fantastic thing about that is that we've got these 3D, 13 3D printers that are in the resource centre. They're used um, by students from year 7 to 12 in French, in, um, in PE, in maths, in history, across the board. And the, the beauty of that is that it provides our young people with the ability to design prototypes. You know, they can actually start to look at things much more um, at a concrete level because it helps them with their conceptual development. So that's across the board, okay? And finally, it's um, one of the questions I was asked, why I think it's important to work with STEM with our staff, our students and the wider community. Because it demystifies STEM, makes it real and personal. And that's what you're doing. That's what Monash University is doing today. So to try to demystify it, make it real and personal. The other important thing is that STEM is bigger than what happens in the classroom. It has to be. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to the young people. So that's where our challenge is as educators. And um, last year, the school began the Bringing Science to the Community lectures and some of the staff that are here tonight, the passionate math science teachers from Blackburn High School, attended um, 
this particular lecture and it was by Dr. David Nayagam who was part of a research team that developed the bionic eye. We invited the wider community and staff and we had primary school kids and their families etc that attended. Now David spoke about how critical it was to have an integrated approach by experts from a range of areas, experts in psychology because the ability of being able to see light and day is, is something that um, is profound for people that are born. So, so, you know, we had the psychologists, we had the physicists, the nanotechnologists, whatever we had around the place, they were there and, and, and the only reason that this real life problem was solved in terms of blindness was because we had this integrated approach and it was real and he was talking about the, the process and the journey. So that's um, how we approach it at Blackburn High School, okay? Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. And I'm going to echo you a little bit in the way I start and emphasise as well that STEM skills are increasingly important for the competitiveness of the Australian economy and to the Australian workforce. And we're hearing this quite loudly in the media. Um, therefore, as educators, we need to focus on making math, engineering, technology and science more engaging and practical. And there is also a need for both teachers and students to consider values when teaching STEM. And I emphasise the word value and bring an effective domain to what we could study in STEM. So to define values first, values in education are inculcated through the nature of science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And notice I'm playing around with the words in the order of STEM um, to show that they're all as significant as each other and individual experience and thus become the personal convictions that an individual regards as being important in the process of teaching and learning STEM. So values in education are in essence the deep qualities that education aims to foster through the school subjects of mathematics, engineering, technology and science. They're a crucial component of the classroom's affective environment and the valuing process involves sort of three main points. The first one being um, that you can choose freely from alternatives what is important to you, and after thoughtful consideration of the consequences of each element, you can prize and affirm to others what you prefer and what you want to do, and then act with choice is the last one, with acting repeatedly in some pattern of life. And these become very significant in a classroom and as teachers, it's the type of decisions you make and what you want to do in your classroom. Um, even the, the Victorian curriculum addresses values through the proficiencies of understanding, fluency, problem solving and reasoning, which are fundamental to learning mathematics and working mathematically. And these proficiencies are evident in STEM as well, STEM learning opportunities, and I'll talk about an example in a moment. So just for a moment, if I could just get you to consider, how would you respond to the following questions and how values influence your decisions? So as teachers, when you're planning the curriculum, do you think sometimes to yourself, should I emphasise prep? or depth of the topics. What out of school visits would I include? How should my mathematics curriculum link with science, language, art and so on? And what big ideas should I focus on the year? What curriculum choices should I offer my students? When you're choosing textbooks and electronic teaching aids, what do I expect from a good textbook? What extra material should I prepare? How much calculator use, for example, would be desirable for my class and how should I tap into the mathematics resources on the internet? or the science, engineering, etc. When you're planning lessons, how much choice of activity should I give my students? How much routine practice is important for them to gain the understandings that are important for what I'm trying to teach? How much group work would I want to use and how detailed should my planning be? When you're planning assessment tasks and marking schemes, how many multi-digit uh, multiplication problems are sufficient or how many times do I have to get them to solve how to balance an equation in Year 12 chemistry? Should I allow calculator use? Should students grade their own work and their own assignments? When you're assigning homework, do you, I always assign homework after the lesson rather than, the le than before the lesson? Should I encourage parents to help as much as is possible? Should I let my students cooperate on their homework assignments? And finally, when you're grouping students in class, should I allow my students to work with their friends? Should I mix the non-English speakers with the native speakers of English? And depending on how you answer those questions, your values will be expressed. 
and your teaching will be influenced in that. Um, so values exist on all levels of human relationships. On the individual level, learners have their own preferences and abilities that predispose them to value certain activities more than others. And that becomes significant because depending on what you choose and depending on what your learners are valuing, there could be a bit of conflict there. But there are always ways to resolve that conflict by bringing harmony and realigning those values. In the classroom, values are inherent in the negotiation of meaning between the teacher and the students and among the students themselves. Now, a socio-cultural perspective is essential to understanding the role of values in mathematics education because the act of valuing is done by people. The symbols, practices and products of mathematical activity, for example, do not have any value in or of themselves. Only people and the institutions of which they are part can place value on these practices and products. So when we talk a little bit about values, we talk about values in general, like teachers would value honesty, um, for example, and uh, another example of a good behaviour. Um, but there are also some Western mathematical values that Alan Bishop had proposed in 1988. One of them, uh, one of them is called rationalism. And this value involves logical, hypothetical reasoning. Um, so if you value rationalism, you would promote that in your classroom. The next one's objectism. Mathematics involves the ability to create symbols and concrete representations. So encouraging your students to search for different ways to symbolise and represent ideas, then to compare the symbols for conciseness and efficiency is a good way to encourage this value. If you value control, um, most people are very conscious of control, which involves establishing rules, making predictions, and being able to supply ideas to situations in your environment. Control is one of the main reasons that people like mathematics. The subject has right answers that can always be checked, and therefore control is very popular seen in maths classes. Progress, this is the complement to control. This value encompasses abstracting and generalising, both, uh, both of which further the growth of mathematics. Questions that you could ask as a teacher. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you make up another problem that uses the same information but is more complicated? Oh, thank you. That one? Thank you. Thank you. Can you suggest a generalisation that is true for all those examples? So there are questions that you can. The next one's openness. So mathematicians believe in the public verification of their ideas by proofs and demonstration. Asking students to explain their ideas to the whole class is a good practice for developing openness. And in mystery, anyone who has ever explored a mathematical problem or investigated a puzzle knows how mystifying, wonderful and surprising mathematics can be and the other parts of STEM, and mathematics is full of these mysteries. Um, there was a study done where some of these values were explored in terms of mathematics and science, and some differences were found. So for the ideological dimension, mathematics educators favour the cluster of rationalism, while the science ed educators were found to favour the cluster of empiricism. In the sentimental dimension, both groups favour control, but the values of progress, scientists seek to deepen understanding of relationships rather than construct new knowledge, knowledge as in mathematics. And in the sociological dimension, the last two, important difference in both the openness and mystery classes, with science being related more to the humanising aspect of knowledge compared with mathematics. The question I want to ask you here is, can we learn from these differences or create integrated learning opportunities to satisfy or compensate these preferences? Please. Also, if we are aware of the student's preferred value structure, we can create STEM learning opportunities that are preferred by the students and may indeed promote engagement in STEM learning. So there is a bit of value in finding out what your students actually value in their learning to see whether you can come up with these activities expressing those values in class as well. When I was a teacher, one of the um, uh, competitions that I used to really enjoy entering were Tournament of Minds. It's a problem-solving program, which most of you have probably heard of, uh, for teams of students from both primary and secondary years. And I was always a teacher that was very keen to enter mathematics and engineering teams. Uh, when I was teaching, I enjoyed entering a group of students in a maths engineering competition in 2004. And the problem that year was called Decipher Decode. And the problem was your team must build a machine to decode two passwords according to a mathematical rule. 
you must also explain how your device works. Now this was a really interesting uh, activity that the students had to do because they, the students were a small group and they worked together and part of Tournament of Minds is that it has, the teacher does not have a lot of influence and has to allow the students to work together. So while they were working together, they were showing signs of understanding, fluency, problem solving and reasoning, which are the values of the proficiencies in the Victorian curriculum. And as a team, they were able to build a machine to decode two passwords according to a mathematical rule. They also needed to explain how their device worked, so the value of communication came in. And in this learning experience, students worked together with little direction from the teacher to complete a good STEM type task. In fact, they had to present this in front of a panel of judges. They had to come up with a role play to describe the, how their machine fits in. So the whole experience was something that became rele very relevant to them. And although it was pretend, it was a way of exploring science, engineering, mathematics, all at once, and technology. Um, just like we talk about integrating science, technology, engineering and mathematics, we also integrate our expertise with the science team and the mathematics team down at Monash University. And I am um, part of a values research team uh, led by Associate Professor Wee Chong. And at the moment he's starting to ask us some questions that I think are becoming very significant. What values of the STEM sub subjects need to be inculcated in students to maintain their engagement with the subjects at higher levels of schooling? How can these values be inculcated or taught? How do excellent STEM teachers align the different values in their classes so their productive learning and teaching takes place? We cannot answer these questions without you, so we hope that we can all work together to try and develop and enhance better STEM practices. Oh. Hi everyone. <laughs> now I'm too far. No, I'll leave it. I'm Gil Kidman. Um, I started my teaching, and in fact, most of my career was um, in Queensland. And I remember my first day of teaching, I was secondary trained, was in a year eight, the first year of high school um, in Queensland, and I was told I was teaching SAMS, S A M S. And I thought, oh, who is SAM? But SAMS was the acronym that we had for Science and Mathematics Studies. And so it was the first day of the year, and so I had to sort of integrate the, the science and the maths, and I thought, I can do this. I have the same group of kids, and I'd have them for two hours, first thing in the morning, every single day. Brilliant. And then after Easter, so nine weeks later, we would bring in the Social Studies um, team into the task as well. Okay, so I had a very big learning curve. What I had to suddenly um, develop is what I'm calling a STEM literacy. I had to be on top of what this integrated teaching was, well and truly ahead of the kids. You couldn't just do it the night before, sort of thing. But this is what we were attempting to get the kids to do. Accept changes driven by new um, technology. We had the early computers, if you like, in the classroom. We were teaching them Fortran. Um, that's the computer coding with colouring in on cards. Oh, look, I'm talking 1990, you know, previous century here, so that's cool. Um, Multi-level impacts of everything that they do. You can't just go and do this and expect that to happen because you've got this ripple-on effect. And so it was taking that, war that broader um, perspective. We had to communicate. We didn't just do graphing in maths because we did it every morning five days a week and it was very much an integrated approach and I think it's largely on that basis that a lot of the, um, the successes that we had in this extremely low socio-economic academic, socio school um, resulted from. The kids saw purpose in their learning, they stopped wagging class and so we were able to turn around a whole lot of lives, um, I'd like to think anyway because the kids were paying attention. They didn't get stuck into those individual little silos. Oh, I've got maths. Oh, I've got science. And it was a really a powerful model. And that, that's the, the beauty of the integrated, um, idea of the integrated curriculum, if you like. We needed specialist pedagogies that would actually support that. 
and I'm trying to rack my brain um, on some of the things that we did do. But the first thing that um, I remember is that we made it explicit. If you were in maths or when you did maths last year, remember when you did this, we're going to take it from maths and we're going to bring it into today's lesson. Or remember last week in geography type of class, we're bringing it in. So you make those cross subject um, links quite explicit to the kids. That's making the reality for them. They can see why they do this one, why they do that, and it brings it all together. Next slide, if someone's able to... I don't know. <laughs> Ah, okay. So, I like to think of STEM as being an entity, and the old cliche, the sum is greater than the individual parts, and you'll see towards the end of my five minutes um, where that's actually coming from. I use it as a bit of a metaphor to um, describe the teaching that we did do all those years ago. But to, to show how it's a little bit different here for each of the four subjects, if you like, or the learning areas as we now call them, how having a STEM focus is different to the disciplinary focus. So in science, we might do an investigation on acid rain and what acid um, can do to something. Instead, we design a product or a process that will reduce the likelihood of acid rain. So it's the same basic activity, but we're getting them to design something to use with it. In terms of technology, go beyond the ICTs and look at technology as a tool. Learn to use the tool, design the tool. It's a much more powerful way. Engineering. Now, this is a fascinating one. From what I see a lot of um, the STEM curriculum materials that you find on the internet, a lot of it starts with science at the centre. Now, I'm a scientist. I was in a previous life before I became a teacher. Science is my passion, but I don't think STEM needs to hang off science. I think it more um, comes off the engineering and the technology side of it because there's so much more that we can do from those perspectives rather than from the science or the mathematics. They're all important, but that's where I base my, my teaching and my research. If you look up the engineering design process, what engineering in classrooms um, is involving, you might find a similar diagram to this, but you will definitely find all of those terms. The important thing is that it's not linear, although it's often presented as a list. There's no starting point in the classroom. You can start with doing some research and then you start imagining. You can quickly zip down to create. You can go up to defining your problem. It's a very messy process, but that's the beauty of it. Providing you're being explicit with your students, that you're getting that knowledge from here, take it from there, bring it all together. You won't find it all in the one place. And of course, mathematics, they use their skills. It's a usage rather than just oh, more mathematical problems, as Penny was saying. So I think for successful STEM literacy to be developed in our kids and for us as teachers to be developing it within ourselves, because we've got to have STEM literacy in order to help the kids have STEM literacy, is that we have to have a mind shift. So it's important that we start to get our kids to work in teams and not as the individual in the classroom doing the individual exam, getting an individual result. Because in the real world, engineers don't work as individuals. They're part of massive big teams, teams that are working from different countries. You can even have teams in different classes, which is what um, probably happened in your tournament of the minds. Yeah. And Get away from the idea that in maths, I'm sorry to pick on maths, maths teachers, that there is the one correct answer. It could be a, a little bit of a deviation, but go with it. You learn from the mistakes. Come on. Now we're going backwards. Okay, so what that basically means is that STEM, I don't see it as a subject, I see it more as a curriculum. It's a set of um, activities or a way of teaching um, that you can actually use with the children, with the class, doesn't matter whether they're in grade one or grade 12, and 
you take it as a, a consolidated idea. It's the transfer of knowledge from one area and the ability to use it in another context. Put it into context, not one subject to the other. Because subjects don't exist in the reality in the real world. We've got contexts. And I think that's what we need to remember as well. Okay, so which knowledges? What do we take from each individual learning area? From science, maths, technology or engineering? That depends on what the problem is. Fractions might be the flavour of the month for some particular STEM problem. So you can really develop the fraction ability um, of your students. But then it might be area and measurement for another problem. So there is no one set of skills. Each subject has its own defined um, content area, if you like, the content knowledge. You pick and choose. So over the year, or over a two-year span, whatever, you will be developing all those basic uh, math skills or, or science skills or whatever. You've got to learn, or get, get your students to learn, that failure is allowable. No scientist will sit there, do something, and it works first time. I heard a number, something like 98.999% of all experiments fail or something, in the real world. But that's how you learn. And that's what the kids have to be able to figure out as well. <coughs> so, what might it look like? I just alluded to, um, we've got these different areas. Well, we would have. <laughs> Here we go. There are four of them. Separate disciplines, maybe. But we can't teach it as a set of four disciplines. And I think in some places, that's what's happening. We're saying, OK, we've got science, mathematics, engineering, technology, whatever's in them, and we'll just do it, and we'll take this bit of maths and put it in here and hope for the best. I think that is largely why STEM is floundering in some classrooms, because we're doing that disciplinary approach. And I think that's quite normal. We were all trained to be maths, science, history, PE, health-type teachers. We did that when we were at school. We're very much linear. But that's not the trick, I think, um, that's needed to do STEM successfully. What we need to do, and eventually it'll come up, hopefully. <coughs> Technology always fails. I will keep going. Here we go. All right. What we have is a series of cross-disciplinary, if you like, interdisciplinary, maybe. We're supposed to have another arrow coming through here. Someone else want to just keep clicking and I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, we're not talking about just getting cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. What we need is this integrated disciplinary teaching because that is all your types of disciplinary that we currently understand and the essential blend of the inquiry coming in. You do tap into your different disciplines, but you have to do it through inquiry. You want to keep going? So, what does it look like? I'm going to use a metaphor. In the interest of time, I have a cow. A cow could be any of our four preferred subject areas, science, technology, um, mathematics, or engineering. But we have the cow, and we've got multiple things that we value from it. We can have milk. We can have the hide to make the leather. We can eat the meat. We can use its strengths to plough the fields or whatever. It's got a whole heap of positive aspects to it. But exactly which one we want to use on any one particular day depends on our bigger picture of things. Likewise, we have a pig. We can have ham, we can have bacon. Um, what else can we do for a pig? Oh, the bristles for your hairbrush. Okay. We've got things we need with a pig. We have a hen. We've got feathers to keep me warm with my feather quilt in my pillow. Um, nice meat. We've got eggs. So again, we've got multiple things that this small little animal has to offer. What we pick on any particular day depends on our bigger picture. We've also got a sheep. Again, we've got the wool. We've got the milk. I don't drink sheep's milk. I don't think I've ever tried it, but I do like sheep's cheese. We've got the meat, yum. But again, 
what we pick depends on what we value in any one particular time. And I think that's the, the bottom line of what I want to say, is that each of our four subjects has a particular strength. We need to tap into it according to what our bigger contextual um, problem is. Please work. <laughs> so this is how it, eventually we will see how that looks in a, um, a STEM context. We'll move on from the metaphor. Here we go, here we go, it's moving, good. Hence the barn. A little bit of argy-bargy there, blending it in. Oh, can't forget our hen. <laughs> and one more. Oh, she's gone. But what you just saw a flash of, if ever it comes back, um, is an Erlegende Volmuch. Danny, please. Yes, it's an egg-laying wool milk pig. It's a multi-purpose animal. But you only have to feed one animal, not four. So there's advantages from blending the four together. Very, very carefully, exactly what you want for whatever your purpose is. And so I think that is, to me, what STEM is and what we need to be doing with our teaching. Being careful what we want according to the context, according to the problem. And so now I'm going to hand you over to Professor Danielle Schmeink from the Cologne University in Germany. She's going to give you an example from how they do this um, integrated disciplinary teaching in the primary context in Germany, if it works. Oh, it is. Good. Yeah, now it's working. Now it's working. Is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was trained uh, to be a primary school and high school teacher in Germany and have um, worked in a school for many, many years. Before I then have had the chance to move to university to become what I'm now. I'm a teacher trainer. I'm a professor for science and social sciences. And this is already the slightly small difference that um, is the difference between me standing here and them. Um, my job is to teach really science and social sciences for um, teachers that will end up in primary school or in high school looking for children with special needs. The special needs one is one part, it's not all of them become special needs te teacher, but they all have to do science and social sciences. And the difference what I have heard so far is, for me, I already grew up with the idea of science and social sciences. Because when I went to primary school by myself, I have a subject that was called primary, schools and, uh, primary science and social sciences. And I never learned subjects like geography, history, politics as separate subjects. So for me, it was always a combination of everything. And I would like to show you a little bit of what we believe in when we are teaching this subject and what our aims are. So my main 
rec my, my, my biggest focus group are the children, a little bit older than this one, but I've chosen this one, and if the video would uh, work on this computer, you would see that this child is ex doing a lot of very freedom choosing experiments with water. Um, if you would have the long version, she would even mess herself up with water a lot, and that is also a lot of experience that she got out of that, but she was playing around with the water all the time. This child is not in my class. She will get a lot more experiences, and this is why I always tell my students we have to take into account all these experiences that they have. Um, they have already learned a lot. They have a lot of knowledge. Some of it is not correct already, but they have all these experiences and learning aspects that they have come across when they were children. So then they come into our classroom. And by the way, so far they have not realized anything about subjects or differences, but they have already got to know a very complex world where things link, are linked into each, uh, into each other. For sure, we also look for... <laughs> if it works. Ah. So we also try... like this. We also take into account the subjects. It's not that we do not know that subjects exist, and we also know that they are very spe uh, special in a way. Um, when we are, for example, looking for history, because that's part of our subject also, or we are looking for politics, then we know exactly that, that an historian has other, um, uh, a history person has other um, ways of um, doing research, of thinking, of acting, and doing all this. So we take that into account. And we want that our uh, children also s are able to identify and to take into account all these different possibilities. And you can see the pics that we have seen so far. We know all the special good things that we can take from the different subjects. And we also want our children to understand that all these special things um, that are linked to the subject, that they are important in a way, but we still keep this cross-curriculum or the interdisciplinary idea that we are putting the topic in the center. And what I show you now is, this is exactly what our teaching looks like. In okay, so these are the areas that are part of our subject. So we have the uh, social sciences, we have a geographical perspective, history, technical, and a science perspective. And science in itself has all these chemistry, physics, and whatever you want, biology. Um, so this is all part of our subject. And I will show you our competence model. Yeah, that's that one. What on a first view looks very, very complex is very easy to understand. We have the five different perspectives that I have shown you right now, um, all the different subjects and the specialism that is, is hidden behind that. But they are all in the center, um, but especially the topics that link them are in the center. And then we are aware that they are very special ways of thinking, acting, learning in these areas. And we also know that there are very specific topics, you find them here. But what we also find, and that is for me always the positive point when I'm teaching science and social sciences, we have all these aspects that are very much cross-curriculum. There are things that you have to know for every subject. For example, you have to have the ability to, order th to put things in a special order, or to argue about things. You have to do research, the idea of inquiry. That happens in all different subjects. Um, sometimes in a slightly different way, but it is a general knowledge that, or a general competence that every children should learn. And then we have, as just given a small examples, we have this perspective overlapping concepts and uh, topic areas like, for example, complex things like uh, sustainability, mobility, um, health. All these are topics that might be in the center of our teaching, but we try to always get them linked with all different perspectives. And a little bit more into how that really looks like when we are planning our teaching. This is a network that my students or the teachers in Germany would probably, hopefully draw when they are planning. I have put the um, city and living as a topic because that's something that is for primary school but also for older ones. It's an interesting thing. Looking around, what is the environment? What is our city like? And we are trying to then focus on what are the typical things. I will do it on the basis of Cologne, because that's where I'm located. When I think about Cologne, then we have a lot of history. We have a lot of technical things. We have an airport. We have bridges. We have all different stuff. We have even had the Romans, where technology and history is again linked to each other. We have all these geographical aspects. We have the River Rhine. 
we are located in, a, in that place because of the Romans who have used that as their way for transport and they stopped in Cologne because of the position there. Um, by the way, one of the reasons why Cologne Cathedral has survived was because of the position close to the Rhine and close to the tram station. They always hit the wrong um, building. Um, so that was why the, the Cologne Cathedral has survived. It's also again history. We have a lot of nature science in Cologne um, and it's not only because we have all these big research institutes but we are surrounded by fields and farming. We have the coal mining area. We have all this and whatever aspect I focus now on you always see like even coal mining there's something technical, there's something nature science in. There's, there are all different aspects and it also has a little bit historical thing and also social things like, for example, the way um, in the past how people have got all this uh, or done all this coal mining um, in the coal mines. So there are a lot of aspects that you can link to each other. And we really want to, in our classes, focus on all these different aspects. I always say like we are trying to teach the big picture. And this is a, sl a small yeah, shortcut or um, a small bit of the picture that we would like to um, teach in our classes. Remembering to turn the mic on before I start. Um, thank you all for coming tonight, and I just want to thank my co-presenters here for giving me the most fantastic lead-up to the final section here, where I I hope that uh, you'll see the connections in in what I'm about to say from from what they've said. So I'm going to finish. Oh, I'm Beck Cooper. Better tell you that bit too. Uh, I'm going to, to finish this presentation by shifting gear a little bit and thinking about teacher education and what we can do to start thinking about how we best prepare our teachers to teach STEM into the future and considering this from a teacher education perspective. So I suppose what we're really doing is starting to answer some of the things that Joanna highlighted, which is that we are not engaging our students well in the classroom. We're not doing a great job of that, but there is an imperative to do so, a, a government imperative, an education imperative, and uh, an imperative to prepare global, scientifically literate, but STEM literate, picking up on something Jill's be Gil's been talking about, uh, citizens for the future so that they are well prepared to handle what comes to them and what, lay what is laid before them. So in response partially to that there was a, a fantastic project that actually ran with several universities that is known as REMSTEP which was to do with reconceptualising maths and science teacher education programs and I was lucky enough to be part of this but in particular I worked in what was known as Innovation One, which was looking at contemporary science and math, uh, mathematics integrated into initial uh, teacher education programs. So what that really meant was that I got to think about teacher education, and that's what I do, that's my main focus, but I got to think about it alongside a mathematician, Norm, my mate Norm. So Norm is a mathematician in the School of Mathematics at Monash University and we've been working together now for almost two years actually. Um, so but we're getting there. So we worked on the REMSTEP program but I've also been working with Norm to work with some other mathematics lecturers to get them to think more about their teaching and learning. Now the reason that that happened was because I got Norm thinking about his teaching and learning but he got me thinking about what it meant to teach and learn maths. But in particular, he got me thinking about what that maths was and why it was important for students to know that. So what Norm and I did initially when we were putting this, this program together was we started to think about why we needed the change and what was important for us to emphasise. What did we actually have the opportunity to do here? Now, particularly for Norm, his priority was to really emphasise the nature and the beauty of maths that he felt was so often left out of the curriculum. And I think he's probably right. 
He sees the maths curriculum as a mathematician as something quite distant from what it is that he does. He sees it as quite distant from what it is that he actually likes about maths. In fact, he saw greater connections in the science curriculum than there were in the maths curriculum with what it is that he actually does. And that was a bit disappointing for him. And I can understand that. He wanted to show that the mathematics that is taught in schools is only the tip of the iceberg of what it is that mathematicians actually do and that what is possible to be done with maths and what students can use it for. Which I also think is a really important thing that we often fail to emphasise with students in, in maths classrooms. He also wanted to broaden the pre-service teachers' views of mathematics as well as their views of mathematics education and what it meant to be an educator of mathematics. Now that seems like a fairly mundane kind of obvious statement, but to be an educator of mathematics means to have a view of mathematics that you want to share. And where he found or where we found as we sat and as we chatted, this was sort of starting to unravel a little bit, is that there weren't great opportunities within the curriculum for teachers to show that broader view of mathematics and what it could do. And so to be a great educator of mathematics, you kind of have that view and that vision for yourself. Now it's my turn to have trouble with it. So the other thing we came to recognise was that, was that there were some big things that perhaps Norm and I had learnt just through our conversations together and through working on this project. So I certainly learnt a lot more about how mathematicians work in my conversations with Norm. And I'll get to that a little bit further when I tell you a bit more about what he does. But Norm's big learning, Norm's big finding and Norm's big recognition out of this was that he learned the value of expanding the way that he, as a scientist, and he referred to himself as a scientist as well as a mathematician, thought about education itself and the power that education has to shift the way people think about science and maths and what are the possibilities for it. So he's a maths lecturer, but he does do quite a bit of work in schools as well. And he said that really, that even just our conversations had made him far more aware of the power he had to share what it is that a mathematician does and what it is that maths can achieve through education and through better education of these ideas. So what was it that Norm and I were working towards? Well, Norm and I were working towards producing three videos that could be used for pre-service or for in-service teacher education. So our biggest debate initially was what were these videos going to be about and why? So we initially started by looking at the curriculum and hence parabolas. Because from what we could see, parabolas was something that reoccurred and reoccurred and reoccurred and reoccurred at different year levels. But we thought it was a good opportunity to perhaps explore parabolas in a different way. Now I'm not going to show you any of the videos today, but they are all available on the Monash website or also from the REMSTEP website. So they are open access, they're free to the public for anybody who does want to have a look at them. But the next two areas that we chose, we very deliberately decided not to do anything that was specifically, get it, not, Come on, people, I know it's been a while, but come on. Thank you. Not to do anything that was in the maths curriculum. So not is actually Norm's major area of research. So he decided that it was a good opportunity for him to speak a little bit about what it was that he does. So his not theory research, one of the things that has been done with it is that he has actually uh, written some uh, formulae and equations for unravelling knots that have been used in computer programming to help with unravelling DNA. All right, so that's sort of that's the area that he really works in. Of course, I'm giving you the 25 word version or less example of what it is that he does. It's obviously far more complicated and complex than that. 
but that's sort of, it, it is what he does. The other option, the other topic that we came up with looking at was fractals. Part of our other reason for choosing fractals and not was that there were aspects of the math curriculum that we could see that these would link to, that would perhaps offer free service teachers and in-service teachers some ways of saying, here's what you could do if you knew this. So we spent a bit of time putting these videos together and thinking about how we would be able to communicate the ideas around knots and fractals so that they could be used in classrooms with students as well as for educating teachers. So not actually a really easy task. Knots and fractals are fairly complex ideas. So I like to think that we've achieved it, but I can tell you it, it was with great pain. So, oh, okay. So what we did was we, we had a lovely time and we made these three fabulous videos, but then we ran some focus groups with both pre-service and in-service teachers to see whether or not these were actually useful things for them. Here's what we found. The teachers and the pre-service teachers both believed that interest in beauty and maths were really, really important. They didn't deny that, but they did admit that they did find it difficult to emphasise it in the classroom. And I don't think that's anything that will be unfamiliar to, to most of you out there. So one of our recommendations was to actually put greater emphasis in our initial teacher education program on working from student interest and building lessons and units and providing ideas about how to make links to the, to the curriculum, but from the student interest. So not taking the curriculum and forcing that to be the student's interest, but actually taking the student's interest and perhaps finding ways to link it back to the curriculum. In the same way that we had set out to say, here are knots and here are fractals, which are things that mathematicians are currently working on and linking them back to the curriculum. Taking the contemporary ideas of maths and science that are actually issues at the moment and linking them back to the curriculum rather than saying, here's the curriculum and here's what we need to do. We also found that particularly with fractals and knots, a lot of the teachers said, hey, that's a really great idea, but we don't know anything about them. They're not areas of maths that we've actually studied. So there was an idea that having knowledge and confidence around these contemporary maths ideas was actually essential in order to be able to explore them, to play with them, to build in on that student interest. And so, one of the things that we came out with with a bit of a recommendation was that notion of creativity and exploration and how important it is, particularly in a subject like math, to encourage that in students, but also to encourage it in our pre-service teachers. For them to be able to play a little bit, which sort of goes to, to Gill's notion, uh, notion of failure is acceptable. That sometimes you have to have a go and let things happen and let things play out. Um, also the notion of dealing with problems that are far more realistic. Things that are actually issues that are problems now and dealing with those rather than saying let's just see what's in the textbook. Finally, it was very loud and clear from the teachers, more so than the pre-service teachers who perhaps weren't quite as familiar with the curriculum, that contemporary maths is not what we actually see in the curriculum. It's just not there. And actually, Norm echoed that from his point of view, that the things he knows are issues within maths research and, and our current maths problems and things that are being dealt with are not what is there for students to play with and explore. So again, our decision to pick two videos that were not directly linked with the curriculum is, we hope, an opportunity to help teachers and pre-service teachers perhaps think a little bit more broadly about what might be possible in maths, in science, and to start bringing out some more re realistic problems that do encourage the idea of STEM rather than sticking with the silos that we actually have.
thank you so much for coming tonight. And I'm going to hand over to Ange for some questions. Um, of course, I'd say start with the Monash Surge website, which does incorporate um, our work on the REMSTEP project, but a lot of other projects that have come out of, of science education, and I think I'm sure the same could be said for the maths education website, and also for the new media research, if I got that name right, learning and new media research, is that the right name? Thank you. Um, which um, uses a lot of digital technologies in teaching and learning. So, of course, I'm going to say start with Monash, people. <laughs> I think it's worth also looking at um, external competitions that are run by STAV and Math Mathematics Association, um, things like Science Drama Awards, the Science Talent Search, uh, Tournament of Minds. They're really good to get involved and... In my experience with teaching, when we entered those competitions, there was a lot of excitement from the students. They all of a sudden found a lot of relevance in what they were studying, um, especially when they were given a lot of opportunity to present their work in different science talents, which in particular was very good with that. Um, so have a look at what is available out there. Just to add to those, the future problem solving, um, they had their... Oh, I can't remember what. At the end of last year, they have their Australian Championships. The Australian team has just gone last weekend over to the US and took out some champions and major prizes. Um, the director is from Monash, so give them a bit of a plug. But yeah, there's lots of competitions. Um, you can also just take anything from a science fair. But I think the appropriate thing to do is to find out, first and foremost, what are my students into? And you build from the student and then go and get guidance from Monash or from any of the competitions. But it has to be housed within the student. Sometimes it's worth working with a colleague and, you know, oh, teaming yeah. up with someone and sharing ideas as to what you're finding common between each other and then working together. That's very, very powerful. And that's what got me into science drama. One of my good friends at my school was into drama and language and I was a science maths and we got together. So and just adding to that, also going to your association conferences um, yeah, so attending the teaching conferences and getting a lot, of, a lot of ideas off your broader network of colleagues. I think my mic's still on, so that's okay. Um, I think really one of the best ways to start accommodating the use of technology is to use it when you need it. Um, and so some of that's built out of um, what we've been talking about, which is responding to students needs and questions and then making good decisions about when to use technology and perhaps when not to. I mean it also depends on what you define as technology. Um, but I think it's in the decision making um, and making good quality well thought about decisions based on what students are interested in, what they need um, and what you're trying to achieve at, at the time. Um, so I don't know that it's about one right way to do it. Um, I think it's more about making good decisions uh, based on the need, the context, the students, and what it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I don't know whether they can hear me. Um, yeah, uh, for, for me it's always the same. I would not think about the question of when I'm doing um, STEM or science or technology. It is really we are looking for the child and that is what I, would all, I always would look for. And then what does the child in that moment need? And if technology is hurting us for that, that's fine. And if not, okay, leave it out. Um, and it's, it's also like the processes. Um, if they are supporting uh, our message and what the children need in that moment and what brings them more further forward, um, then everything is warmly welcome. And I would not even call it just like STEM. If art is an add-on for what is necessary right now, yeah, put art and music in whatever is necessary, sport lessons, um, yeah, why not using them? I was just um, remembering when my children were in primary school, um, they, they were doing STEM. The more I think about it now is that they had a thematic approach to things. Mm. And you remember I said that, um, you know, we, we're thinking that we're reinventing the wheel, but um, a thematic approach where it's a, 
as you need basis, which you're talking about, I need a little bit of maths, I'll bring them in and I'll talk to them about calculus because they're going to require that in terms of rate of change, whatever it is that we're talking about. So, so the important thing is as you need it. But the practical thing is that um, how do we balance, and this is a question that um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually asking the panel. <laughs> okay. How do we balance the, um, the needs of the, the families and students in terms of ensuring that they get a really solid education and they're prepared for these wretched exams to get a really important ATAR. Um, how do we reconcile that with allowing them to play and learn? Because that's really the question here. And we have got a framework the Victorian curriculum if you're in the government school or Catholic schools. I mean independent schools a little bit have more freedom but see that's really what we've got to decide. Um, some schools are using um, seven to nine like mangroves where you try everything and you practice and you rehearse etc and then senior school 10 to 12 is where they start the fairly you know the more traditional way of, of approaching it. Um, so I think that's really the question. The, the thematic approach was used in primary schools and the children learnt a lot. So when I was um, teaching in a school I worked with uh, a colleague whose name was Wojtek and um, actually I worked on a research project with Deb Corrigan at the same time and uh, Wojtek was or is a, an absolutely wonderful teacher but and he taught BCE biology for many, many years, but he really refused quite point blank to teach to the exam. And his reasoning when we pushed him on this as part of the research project was that he would say that as an expert teacher and as somebody with experience as a teacher and as a biologist with knowledge <laughs> of the course, that he knew what quality learning looked like and he knew how to teach to support students to learn really well. And even though he wasn't teaching them how to answer exam questions really well, he had great confidence that he was teaching these students that he knew in that school, the curriculum that he knew really, really well. And so he would say that it's about building reputation within the school for being a good teacher and that um, the research tells us time and time again that the, the greatest um, support for student learning is having a good teacher. So I sometimes think it's about the teachers believing in themselves mm -hmm. and actually knowing that what they're doing is supporting quality learning for the students that they have in their classroom. Now, Wojtek was in a position where he actually had a sufficient amount of evidence to back this up because his students did exceptionally well at Year 12 Biology. Um, but he would say that it comes from starting at Year 7 and from making sure that your best BCE teachers are also teaching Year 7, Year 8, Year 9 and Year 10 at some point in time. Obviously not all of that, we don't want to kill them in the process, <laughs> but we do want to make sure that they're not exclusively teaching BCE. We want to make sure that also some of our better teachers who are teaching great Year 7 and Year 8 are also teaching at VCE. Um, we want to make sure that secondary teachers are learning from primary teachers and that perhaps some of that thematic approach that we've all spoken about is transferring up to the senior ends of, of school. Um, and that perhaps we are taking the risks as teachers as well as leaders in schools to do what we know results in quality learning and standing behind it. I think we need to mainly focus on the very key understandings and if we can focus on the key understandings of any subject you'll probably find that they overlap with other subjects. Um, so looking at it holistically is probably a good way to start to address it because once you start to look at the key understandings then you're going to target and pinpoint more deep level learning rather than surface level learning. Um, and you tend to see that over time and, and it is about taking risks and believing in yourself as a teacher and um, you know, giving yourself some time to experiment and say, okay, if I took it from a different approach and used your way of assessing it over a certain time, you would find that your belief is probably true. 
and so do you know that that is better? I was just going to add that um, by teaching the child to think at an early age and following that through, when they come to that critical time of year 11 and 12, then you can put them into you know, different subject areas. We do that in Queensland, but we also have common assessment between them, should the child want to do that. Every term there is um, an in experimental investigation, and if the child is doing physics, chem and biology, they can do one assignment. But it has to meet the criteria for each of the individual subjects. And because the kids have grown up through all of their schooling, knowing how to integrate and knowing how to think um, inter interdisciplinary, it's not a problem for them. And they do get the equivalent of good ATARs, they do go on to do university, they're just normal kids. But, uh, I can speak a personal story, I'm a mum to a 10 year old little boy who uh, for a long time has always wanted me to sit next to him when we're doing homework. And it was only until recently that I had a conversation with him and I said, I know I've done my job and I start becoming redundant in your learning. And that doesn't mean I'm not interested because I'm always here for support. Going back to the technology question, it's helping children identify the need. So if they're trying to do a graph, for example, and they're doing it on paper, then maybe introducing them saying, you know, when this is done in, in commerce or in, in business, people use Excel. Let's have a look at Excel. This could be a quicker way for you to do it. And that's ideally what technology is all about. Um, so with my son now, I'm starting to say, you know, a lot of the common things you tend to say, ask me before you ask me. What are the support systems around you to help in your learning? And it was a nice day yesterday when I was down, you know, ironing in another room and I went upstairs thinking he was probably just sitting on an iPad or something and he came and he said, I finished all my homework, I knew what to do and what I didn't know, I went there and got it. So it does happen but it takes a long time and he's 10. So I can't say, I've only started to see that now and that's been me being a risk taker as a mum and gone, I'm going to back off now and just watch what you can do. Science is essential, irrespective of the age of the person. Yeah. It's divorcing it from reality. I, I wouldn't like to see that. I think the inquiry has to go together with the, the disciplinary knowledge. Um, so by splitting it, you're creating something that's artificial. Um, so no, I wouldn't go down that pathway. I think it's important that every teacher is teaching it. That's my preferred model. Uh, a lot of schools do get the science specialist teacher in or something like that. I think that further sets up the um, illusion that science is separate, rather than it's all around us. You're the, the all around me teacher in the primary. I think they have the, um, the better model of the classroom teacher teaching it. But then a lot of the teachers don't have the background or the, the confidence. So a specialist is better than nothing. Um, but I think we should be putting a whole lot more effort into bringing all of those um, primary teachers who don't have a background or an interest in science up to where they're comfortable. I um, do agree that as an immediate step that could mean that, that those teachers are working in collaboration with the specialist teachers. Yes, definitely. Rather than having, that's your non-contact time um, in which you can do report cards or something. No, I don't. Yeah. It's like the, the everyday primary teacher, um, I think, needs to sit in on the, the loach lessons mm. because then they can build that in. And so if you're, if you're doing a thematic unit and you've suddenly heard the, the word for truck in Korean or something, if you've taken an interest, you can bring that in and you can strengthen the, the language skills. Um, it's not just silos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it needs a commitment from the school leadership that something goes um, and that there is an expectation that there is an integrated approach um, within certain disciplines that is going to be assessed and valued. So that's really, but again, we have to be careful because with, the st with teachers there's, there's growing um, pressures on, on teachers in all of the three um, areas, in the government, um, Catholic and, and independent schools, 
more and more is being asked of them, but something has to go and then that is put in there and is valued and is, is nurtured and fostered. So really that's what needs to happen. Um, I really think, I really agree with what Joanna said. It does need to start with the support being put into place so that teachers are allocated at least some time, some resources, some professional development in order for them to feel better skilled or better, um, are more confident to be able to try something. Sometimes it could just start with, I think you need to think small rather than large immediately. So it could be just some collaboration with two staff members that all seem to be working quite well together and to see how does it work and you, you know, work with each other for a little while and what projects come out that way and hopefully the two staff have opposing or different skills, as we all do. Um, yeah, so I think it needs to start with the support to build up confidence for that. The other thing too that um, just came to my mind is that um, we as teachers, if we see value in something, we get excited, then the kids get excited. So, so we also have to be promoting the importance of this STEM approach, this way of thinking as critical for preparing them for VC in life. I mean, that's the other thing as well. So the excitement, that, I know that we've sort of talked about gloom and doom, but it's fantastic. STEM for us is real, it's authentic learning, and it really um, will be the way we engage our students. So the teachers need to, to be sort of encouraged in that area, and, um, and maybe we talk a little bit more about why it is relevant and why we should do it rather than why we can't. I think the, the opposing teachers need a little bit of help to see the beauty of what is possible should they broaden their mind, whether it's on integrated disciplinary teaching or STEM or whatever, but they just need a little bit of convincing. In Germany we are talking about a lighthouse leadership. So sometimes it's nice to have one teacher starting about it and then there's a nice frame in Germany, I don't know whether I can translate it proper, but it is a bit like um, do good things but also talk about them. So maybe doing some nice things in your class and then really talk about things and make other colleagues um, yeah, see the beauty of what all this um, allows you in your teaching and offers for your students. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, I would say be willing to take a risk and embrace the change and be ready to learn from it and model that learning for your students um, and model and be part of that learning with your colleagues. But uh, my big thing is take a risk.